Hi, I'm Ricky Alexander. And I'm Sweet Meg. Welcome to the Back Porch. We have a very special guest this week. You know him as a go-to sideman in some of New York's greatest jazz bands, uh, Mr. Mike Davis. So we want to start with talking about how you got going with this stuff. What, what were you into first before you got into the early jazz and then what brought you to it and inspired you and made you who you are today? <laughs> well, my background initially was in classical music since my parents were both in the Seattle Symphony. So I grew up playing in youth symphony and school orchestra and then school jazz band. And I was very fortunate to go to a, a public school, but with an excellent arts program. But I didn't have a strong artistic drive to make any particular kind of music, any flavor of jazz, because there are, jazz is an enormous umbrella, just like classical music is. I didn't really feel connected to it. I didn't have a need to make that music until I was halfway through music school already as a jazz major. Um, and I went to my friend Jay Ratman's master's recital and it was an epiphany for me. And I said, I need to play this music. How do I learn to do this? Where do I go? What do I do? And Jay sent me to the jam session at Mona's. Didn't know any songs, but they'd let me sit in anyway. And then I'd write down every song that was called for the whole jam session every week for six months until I learned a decent number of songs. And it just felt so open and welcoming and such a, such a collaborative teamwork-based spirit to making music that is primarily ensemble-based, not, not soloist-based music, even though we take solos. But it feels like we're all playing a, a sport with one team where the goal is all of us scoring together. And it, I've, I've never looked back. Yeah, it's, it's funny how Mona is, I feel like, so many people have that, I mean, I had the same one, but so many people have the same experience with that place and that people come from the jazz world, come from that, you know, and they, it's, it was the welcoming spirit of that place and the joy of that place that I think brought so many of us to this style of music. And it's funny because like, is it just Mona's and the musicians that were there or is it the music itself? You've got something there. Part of it's the songwriting. There's so much joyful, optimistic songwriting. Even when it's melancholic, it's, it's in a, a satisfying way expressing something that we all need to to deal with now and then but it's not just plain depressing or dark the other part of the equation that makes it so magical is all the rest of us hanging out listening to whoever's sitting in at that time when i was younger reading biographies of my favorite jazz musicians from the, like the original generation or two the good old days and everything and thinking wow i wish those gigs were still around but they're not and wow i wish all those cool clubs were still around but things have changed now and wow, they'd really just go to jam sessions and meet people and then get hired for real gigs after jam sessions? That's crazy. It doesn't really work like that. <laughs> but it really does still in traditional jazz. It's not just self-promotion and networking. It's, it's forming an organic connection between each other as artists. So naturally that leads to working together professionally. I've met almost everyone I work with today either at Mona's or through the, the orbit of that community emanating out of there. It's amazing.
I love when you wear those plus fours and somebody asks you about them, especially another musician, because I can point to the back of or the very stage of Mesro Jazz Club, and there's that picture of Louis Armstrong sitting cross-legged in plus fours. It's great. You know, I think our mutual hero. Um, sure. Tell us about tell us about your style. Yeah, before I got into traditional jazz at all, again in my sort of artistically untethered period, I was reading GQ and Esquire magazine and trying to dress dress in style and getting into traditional jazz and reading about Louis Armstrong and Bix Beiderbecke and Frank Trumbauer and seeing pictures in the books, I thought, they, they sound so cool, I want to sound like that all the time. I really want to play this way and that have that be my voice. And I want to look like that too, not just for being on stage, but all the time. I want to live this way. And very often I'm walking around Washington Heights where I live in plus fours and a bow tie and a linen cap and little round sunglasses walking my dog, and somebody says, hey, I really like your style, What what is this? And I say, oh, thanks, I play jazz from the 1920s, so I try to dress like my heroes. Do you get most of your stuff vintage and then fitted to you, or do you find a lot of stuff that's of the style that's made now and then fit it in with vintage? Like, how do you, how do you make the look happen, literally? It's difficult because going that far back, people really were smaller, and I'm usually too I'm not that tall, but I'm too lanky. 1920s jackets that fit me. I mean, I got married in a cutaway coat and striped trousers from 1926 because that's something that didn't get worn out, but just a, a blue suit, say. Somebody wore that until it was done. Yeah. And that guy was 5'4", living in New York. We're lucky to have good tailors like our friend Jake Muser who can, if I bring him something from the 1930s and he says, are you sure you want it like this? I say, yep, just like that. He can really do it. So I've got a lot of uh, bespoke clothing at this point, but things like ties and jewelry just seem to find their way to me. They come home with me. I don't know how it happens. Somebody asked me recently how many hats I have, and I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very patient, tolerant wife who has not nearly her share of the closet space. That's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> So funny, me taking it this way. Don't know if I should, but gee, it feels good. Oh, I'm flying high, but I got a feeling of falling, falling for nobody else but you. You caught my eye. Now I've got a feeling I'm falling. Show me the ring and I'll jump right through. I used to travel single, oh, we chance to mingle, oh, now I'm a tingle over you. So, Mr. Parson. So 
Oh, Mr. 